This presentation is indeed uh, a mixture of my own personal experience in India with those experience I have gathered working with some of our clients. Uh, what they're trying to do is to build an understanding of why we do certain things in India, which when I started working in this field were not obvious to me. And uh, I come to realize that they are not obvious to some of the new people entering the, the market. So I will be sharing with you some, some of my thoughts in that uh, to try to build a, a better understanding of what is possible and what is not possible within yet. Uh, well, I mean, if I say my family, I work in printing, none of them get terribly excited about it, to be honest. Um, people get the impression that it is an easy thing to do. Um, you just want blue there, you just put blue there. You want red there, you just put red there. Uh, how hard can it be? Uh, well, it turns out to be that can be quite hard, actually, to do it right. Uh, because, you know, this ideal printer that we may have in our head, it requires, uh, particularly now, if we adapt to printing additive manufacturing, uh, the ability to transfer matter, ideally, of any arbitrary shape, to, to, to any point in the space we can address somehow. And uh, why would we be we always talk about dots, but really in an idea printer, why would you want to use dots? Uh, you can do much better with uh, uh, some tessellations in two-dimensional space or three-dimensional space that we will cover uh, much better uh, the, 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 the substrate we want to cover or, or to build a 3D structure that we want to build. But there are reasons why we cannot just put an arbitrary shape, uh, whatever we want. Um, and the same with what we actually print in, in terms of what is the function of what we are printing. Generally, we think it's uh, giving color, uh, but in 3D printing, it might be that it's giving a, a structure uh, to the material. And what we see um, in some of the, in the real world is that the, the actual printing mechanisms that we tend to use tend to favor uh, cylindrical geometries or spherical geometries or produce dots uh, and that there is um, kind of uh, material properties behind it and why that is the case. So uh, if we try to constrain what we're trying to do and make it a bit more narrow, um, if nothing else because we only got a limited amount of time to talk about things, uh, think of a 2D ideal uh, dot printer where we want to print dots. Um, well, if we were given the choice, we would have like to have a 2D dot array that just will come and print a, or array in one go. Uh, each individual in the array may be individually addressable. Uh, and that will give it a structure in a two dimensional space. Uh, the, and that's where we're starting to see how. Um, digitalization enters uh, the world of printing. Uh, it's not just uh, that we're digitalizing the images, we're also digitalizing the, the, the available uh, positions in the space that are available to us. And that can produce some strange uh, effects due to the periodicity of the structure that we're building and sometimes uh, some of the RIP algorithms can help us to avoid some of these issues. And in terms of your day, what we would like to print, uh, well, if you want to have a really, really intense image, you would like to, to print something that is a, an active device emitting light, and ideally a pure spectral, or as close as you can get to purely single frequency in the optical domain, uh, that will allow us to build a color space much more easily than we do, for instance, with uh, CNYK inks. Um, now, also, when we are entering the work of additive manufacturing, um, I was in a conference on 3D printing uh, three weeks ago, and I was seeing some people doing jet in binding uh, for metal parts, produce metal parts. And some claims were made that you know those parts were as strong as 
metal injection molding parts equivalents. Uh, and, and it's, uh, well, how can we make such a claim? It's quite a strong claim, really. Uh, how do we ensure through the printing process that actually we're going to achieve that, that we, the amount of binding that we're putting is the right amount of binding? Um, it's uh, something that's perhaps very interesting, but got me a bit worried, too. Uh, because uh, perhaps I know that it is quite difficult to warranty things uh, in 2D printing. It's difficult to make absolutely certain that a drop those cannot land exactly where you want it to, 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 to land. There is uh, some intrinsic errors in that process which make it really difficult to achieve in practice. Uh, because uh, we, People have to build printers in the real world with real components. And those real components uh, don't have ideal behaviors. And uh, it also involves uh, electromechanical parts where we're going to move our substrate relative to our printing mechanism. The printing mechanism itself, which uh, I will concentrate on talking purely on in yet. Uh, nozzle drop ejection in the stock. Um, it's not just ejecting the, the drop. The drop needs to land on a material, and then it's interact with that material. There are some spreading effects, some drop wetting effects, which have a very strong uh, uh, addition to what um, the, the final uh, picture is going to look like. Um, the colors, um, we tend to work on CNYK uh, with uh, real inks with different spectral properties. We have uh, the, 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 the dots that are produced. Um, in some industries, people want to have a very random look to the dot. Other people want to have the dots arranged uh, one color complementary to the other. Other people pref look at having a lot of overlap between different colors. Uh, there is a solution that fits everybody. There, on a scanning printers, we also find that there are quite often problems with um, uh, when we don't run multiple swaths. I mean, this is uh, a bit exaggerated in the sense that uh, there is clearly a, a gap. There is a particularly bad calibration on the mechanical movement of the system. But that's very real. I mean, I have seen a lot of scanning systems where instead of creating a white gap, what people are doing is overlapping those two gaps. Uh, and there are some uh, stitching mechanisms that will allow you and help you to with that process and make it almost invisible. But if you're placing a you want to get a lot of uh, image density or uh, depth of color. You, you may run into problems uh, with having too much ink on those spaces. Um, there is a whole raft of um, things that are possible to do, uh, particularly if the amount of ink you're getting start to cause coalescence in, in, the, in, in those areas where you, you might want to go to different strategies using multiple SWATs and even masking strategies. Uh, and that can get quite complicated. And I think that's not something I'll address here further because I think it's probably something that will need a, a talk on its own right. So here I'm going to talk essentially with two different aspects of inject printing. One I'm going to look at how does the actual drop get ejected? Uh, because there is quite a lot that we can learn about India just by looking into detail into that. The, and then I will look at some uh, aerodynamic effects, uh, assuming that we've got a perfectly uh, motor system where we can place uh, our substrate wherever we want there is still some aerodynamic effect that will impair on our ability to, to place drops exactly where we want to. But first of all, we look at how the 
how we generate the, the drops. There are, let's say, two main aspects to the drop generation in Injet. One is related to the nozzle acoustic properties, which are typically related to the physical dimensions of the nozzle, uh, the speed of sound in the fluid that we're trying to get, and some of the resonant modes that kind of result from those two interactions. And I will show this morning in terms of the presentations, there is also uh, other effects associated with the ink supply channel to those nozzles, but I will not touch those here. Uh, but it's uh, also quite a complicated matter as we saw this morning. Um, from the point of view of the fluid properties affecting drug formation, we got density, surface tension, and viscosity are perhaps the three main ingredients. And, and so they dominate basically the time scales necessary to create a drop or for the drop once it's landed into the substrate to actually reach its final form on the substrate. And um, we will see that in the injet piezoelectric model, in, also in thermal injet, uh, the, the drop is ejected out of the nozzle through a pressure wave. And that pressure wave uh, can sometimes uh, produce a, a cavitation effect in the nozzle that is might cause the formation of an air bubble, which uh, might later on grow up through the process of rectified diffusion. Uh, and having an air bubble in the nozzle is generally bad news, because um, it means that that nozzle will sooner or later become not operative. Really, um, people were observing um, drought formation from a jet of a fluid in the 1800s, and um, Raleigh was the first person to come out with a theory to explain what was going on. And basically, there were previous observations by Plato and others of uh, how a cylindrical flow was breaking into drops. And Raleigh produced a mathematical model which was looking at how the perturbations in the radial motion of that cylinder uh, would propagate. And he basically used classical mechanics where he created a, using a potential flow theory, uh, he built a kinetic uh, term for the energy. And then he used the surface tension to create a potential energy for the energy, created a Lagrangian. Uh, assumed that there was no dissipation and uh, solve the equations of motion with those uh, two parameters. And that means that from, from this analysis, he, he, he was assuming um, those conditions in our flow. Basically, the flow was uh, steady, irrational, implicit, and incomprehensible. And perhaps the what I would say is one of the most important results of inject theory is that he observed that um, uh, the, the radial deformation occurred periodically in the direction of the flow uh, with a period which was uh, directly proportional to the radius of the nozzle. And it's about nine times the radius of the nozzle. And that's quite a remarkable result because uh, it's a purely geometrical constraint. There is no material property in the results there. The material properties came with the time necessary to, to, to produce that drop uh, in, in the forms of the density and the surface energy, and then a geometrical factor with the radius of the nozzle. So basically, if we go to the next slide, we are converting a cylinder of fluid into a drop through, let's call it a geometrical transformation. And that's what the dynamics uh, of the Rayleigh instability is telling us, that there is an optimal length to go from that cylinder into that sphere. And also, there is an optimal sphere that is generated, which is about twice the radius of the nozzle. 
So we see that that kind of lack of dependency on material properties seems to indicate that perhaps this is a technology which is very promising from the point of view of ejecting many other types of fluid. Uh, and indeed it is. Um, we are not yet restricted to that kind of fluid. We, we can also go on the here on the ink property, the material side, we can extend and we do and yet within the technology materials with much complex rheology than the ones we have this the ideal fluids that we have discussed. Um, finally, there is um, an expression here, basically, where we are looking at um, what is the maximum frequency or at which we, we, we can uh, generate that, that instability. And that maximum frequency is related to the speed at which the fluid is ejecting the nozzle uh, and the characteristic lens of the rail instability. But also we can express that as an effect which is related with the hydrostatic pressure. Uh, those early experiments were doing with a tank of water with a certain height and then a small dozen at the bottom. So why they transformed the kinetic energy of the fluid into, sorry, the potential energy of the fluid into kinetic energy, we, we come up with an expression like that. Uh, and we see that that speed is related to pressure and indeed when we go to an oscillator structure that pressure wave is generated through a piezoelectric transducer. Um, but that early experiments and those early theories tell us an awful lot about inject printing. Uh, what I have done here is just, just those, those equations. I put some fluid parameters from um, ordinary fluid which is would be kind of a water-based ink where we have reduced the surface tension a bit. And um, it's worth noticing that as the droplet volume becomes smaller or the nozzle diameter becomes smaller, we got smaller drops and then uh, basically whatever acoustic cavity is generating um, has been used to generate that, those drops, we'll have to have a resonant frequency which is higher than those numbers. So we see that for wavelengths, sorry, for nozzle ra radius of uh, five microns, we will give us um, drops of just a few picoliters. We need very, very fast acoustic cavities of 200 kilohertz or higher. Uh, and this is just with that very simple set of equations. Uh, here the numbers don't tend Try, they are not trying to be perfectly accurate. We're just trying to give us an order of magnitude and give us an indication of that. This theory is telling us uh, an awful lot about the behavior of the system. Um, also, it's worth remembering that the smaller the drop we're trying to get, the quicker it's gonna try to, to, to get form uh, in, in this, in, uh, as it drops from the nozzle. Um, but to build a usable device, we need more than just rail instability. Uh, so we need uh, a ways to create a, a pressure wave inside the nozzle cavity. And typically, this, uh, to first approximation, we can try to model the nozzle cavity as a handhold resonator. And we saw today a lot of um, uh, printed manufacturers spend a lot of time and effort designing those cavities are very complex structure, much more complex than what I draw there and with a more complex behavior. But essentially, we capture the, 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 the essence of the physics with a handphone resonator rather well. And we see that the acoustic frequency is proportional to the speed of sound, which is a fluid property. And then um, a, a geometrical factor that has to do with uh, the, the geometrical dimensions of the resonator. And the last thing that we need then is um, the ability to create a pressure disturbance and that's provided through a piezoelectric being driven with a waveform. Uh, so in this equation here, which is uh, what kind of 
you cannot print any faster than this number there. So your acoustic resonator needs to be able to have a fundamental frequency which is ideally higher than this value. Uh, and then that speed here is given by how much pressure we're able to produce uh, with the piezo structure. Uh, and that is speed also, we, in the real world, we have some dependency on the fluid that we're trying to react. Uh, some of the density, viscosity will have an effect. Uh, and that's the instability from Raleigh. Uh, so what we see in the results from the, uh, kind of a, quite a big nozzle radius, but give us a linear dependency between the drop diameter and the nozzle diameter as we would expect. And we see that there is uh, an idea of, uh, we, we, we try to excite with uh, something that looked like a square pulse uh, and a, uh, a nozzle cavity. We see that if, if our pulse width is too small, we are not able to generate a drop. If our pulse width is too long, we generate satellites. And the pulse width has to be the, the right number to, to create a stable ejection. So clearly, we, we can see some relationship with the, the, the length of that pulse and how, how much of that cylinder we're actually building in time as we keep up pressing down the uh, fluid with our piezo actuator. And you can see that as a drop formation on those three images there, where here we don't have enough time length in our excitation pulse. And we try to get, but we don't quite dislodge drop. Here we produce a good drop. And finally here we produce too much of a cylinder of liquid, and that breaks into more than one part, creating satellite pieces. Uh, on, can we see it over there? Which um, will might land uh, on places what we don't want. Uh, depending on the application, that might be more or less of a problem, but ideally, we tend to prefer just to give it a single drop if we can. So basically, try to summarize this. Uh, there is a fundamental relationship between the radius, uh, which is proportional to the, well, not proportional, related to the drop volume, um, the fluid at which the speed is ejected, and the acoustic frequency of the nozzle. Um, and if we try to drive uh, that nozzle out of those parameters, we don't get um, a very good drop formation out of that nozzle. Either we, we saw before that, either we don't get enough energy to, uh, to, to, to be able to launch a drop, or we got too much energy and we might generate satellites with it. Um, so the PSO electric driving waveform that we apply to the piezo um, and the acoustic properties of the fluid in the nozzle, they need to be chosen and designed in accordance with, with those results. Uh, if we try to make the pulse width too big or too small, we're, we're not going to have a the right waveform for that particular uh, nozzle geometry. Um, only small adjustments uh, to the drop volume are possible just um, by manipulating the waveform, um, by just making it slightly bigger uh, in terms of voltage amplitude. Uh, nevertheless, in many applications where that is, might well be worth doing uh, in order to get a more homogeneous be behavior across the whole nozzles in the printer. Uh, the grayscales in inject uh, are limited then to multiples of the preferred drop volume. There, there is a preferred drop volume. and. If you, when you see that there are uh, gray, uh, gray pr printheads, um, basically what you're doing is getting more than one drop of that minimal drop. So that somehow limits the, 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 the volumes of drop that we can achieve in practice. Uh, and it also means that uh, because we need more time to get more than one drop, grayscale printing is uh, slower than binary printing. Um, so typically, my people quote the fastest binary printing for the printhead. And if you want to do grayscale printing, you will have to reduce that printing speed. 
those are so here we see some results for a particular print head. Uh, we see that there is an optimal ejection speed for a particular time pulse duration printed there. And we see that we don't get necessarily a great deal of gain in, in the road volume by trying to make that pulse bigger. And we're actually losing uh, ejection speed, which is generally bad news for many reasons. Um, in that other plot, we see the, what happens if we modify the pulse amplitude. We see a variation of 20% in the volume of, that is being ejected by the drop. Uh, but we pay a price of a 50% variation in the speed of that particular drop. So um, there is some tuning you can do with um, changing the pulse amplitude, but you won't be able to create something like a 16 different levels of gray uh, by changing the volume. It's just a final, final adjustment. Uh, so the only way to get uh, useful uh, changes in drop volume that produce uh, useful changes in image density is by generating more than one drop. Um, so that also poses some um, means that um, special screen algorithms are required compared to other types of printing to handle uh, digital inject printing. And I would like to stress how important it is to have a good control over the waveform amplitude, just well with that we have seen. Um, if we want to create an optimal drop formation, we need to carefully design our driving waveform. Uh, also, a print head uh, with an also geometry will have a range of Rheological properties of the end will it's kind of yet and to maximize that uh, we, we need to be able to to modify the the waveform and also the the right waveform will be able to produce the the fastest possible printing speed for that particular print head uh, now on slightly different subject uh, electro uh, inject drop placement errors. Okay, there are a whole bunch of them related with electromechanical. Uh, the ones I hate the most are the ones related with putting the wrong encoder in the wrong place, which is fairly common. But there are others as well. Uh, there might be some effect due to the drop to state interaction, but I'm going to concentrate on drop error interaction and some aerodynamics effect. Um, basically, the air viscosity and if flow in the air because of the viscosity will induce a drag and those the small drops will try to print in new drops. And also there are one drop can, a switch volume can produce an eddy that will modify the trajectory of drops adjacent to it. Um, it is possible to build a very simple model purely based on the stock drag viscous force. Um, we can go and solve mathematically and come up with an expression for the dropping velocity for, for a small drop. Uh, and we can integrate that expression and it will give us how it's uh, evolving in, in a space over time. And if we combine that vertical movement with um, drop due to gravity uh, with a, a flow course um, be, between uh, the substrate and the print head, so typically in more printed applications, you will have a print head which is fixed and a substrate that is moving, or a substrate that is fixed and a print head that is moving. So that will create a, a, a flow between the print head and the media. Um, if we model, because we have been careful with our, our aerodynamics design of our print head carrier, uh, if we've got a laminar flow, we can basically have a velocity gradient which is dependent on the distance of the drop to, between the nozzle and, and the media. And because we, from the previous equation, we know uh, how that is evolving in, in time, we can then solve a um, velocity equation on how this flow is dragging um, 
the drop away from what would be the vertical drop position and making it uh, taking a slightly uh, curved trajectory. Uh, so perhaps that's, it's easier to see um, with, if we put again a number of typical numbers that we could see easily in inject printing. Uh, we see that as we keep on dropping, if this is the point of ejection, uh, as it keeps on falling, it keeps departing from the, what would be the vertical trajectory drop would be there. But because there is airflow, it's dragging the, the drop away. So that would be a carriage moving from over right, uh, sorry, from left to right. And that's a drop placement error that can manifest itself as an equivalent uh, uh, printing error. And basically, to, with this very simple model, we just compare some experimental results with the very simple model. And again, we get an agreement within the order of magnitudes of, where, um, of, of the amount of deviation that we will see on those drops, which is uh, perhaps uh, surprising considering how simple it is. Um, but it gives us an idea that any flow between the printhead and the media is going to produce an error in the placements of the drops. And this, um, those are results from a research group in Cambridge University. Uh, and we can see, perhaps here, as the this is the beginning of the motion, this is later on, and this is when the full flow is fully developed. And this is showing uh, through particle imaging techniques or flow imaging techniques how the drops are moving, and those are what represent uh, uh, the flow in the system. And we see that when the flow is not determined, um, we, we got a complex mechanism. At the flow builds up and eventually becomes laminar here. We, we saw kind of a similar shape to the one we saw in the previous model. That means that if you got a bidirectional printer, a scanning printer, uh, you're going to produce an error in the throat placements according to which direction you're moving. And you need to have some mechanisms to adjust uh, the firing uh, frequent, the, the, the firing position especially, whether you're going left to right or right to left. Uh, and you need to be able to, uh, to do that, otherwise uh, you you, you're just not going to, your image is going to look offset, basically. And that will going to be dependent on the throw distance, and it's going to be dependent on the printing speed. So you, have, you change your speed profile, you probably need to recalibrate your printer. And if you change your throw distance profile, again, you're probably likely to need to recalibrate your printer. So, and if you're printing over many colors, that might also affect your, your color calibration in your system. So it's, um, and finally, we, in printers where we got uh, two different rows printing, we see that the effect on the first row can be different to the first in the second row. So if you got a two-color print head printed on two different rows, uh, you might want to adjust individually those rows. So it, you, you, you will need uh, some mechanism that allows you to do that adjustment. Typically, that's done on a print controller by controlling the timing um, that happens between the, an encoder post telling you where to print and how much offset you want to add that, that needs to be variable in order to compensate for this effect. And again, every time you will change them, you will change the, the, the printing speed or the height that will change. This is particularly bad also because you see interactions between the two different rows and, and that's not something we can compensate for. So in conclusion, Basically, the physics of the drop ejection and the formation mechanism impose some restrictions between different parameters in an engine system. So any designer for a printer needs to take that into account because there's going to be a balance between the number of grade levels and the printing speed and the drop volumes they're going to achieve and the printing speed. Um, in, to maximize the full usage of a printhead, the range of radiological fluids that can be printed with a printset 
you need to have good control over your waveform. Um, the aerodynamics effect caused by the airflow between the printhead and the media cause a drop placement error. And that error is function of the relative speed between the printhead and the media, and also of the flow regimes between the printhead and the media. The good news on those particular ones is that those can be minimized by playing with the timing at which we fire the piezo relative to the position of the head. And if your print controller is able to do that, you will be able to, to solve this problem. And you might want to design the printed carriage to have a laminar flow profile between the printing carriage and, and, and the medium. Uh, drop induced edits cause random errors which cannot be compensated for. And the only thing we can do then is to, re to minimize the, the, the interaction length between drops by basically trying to reduce the distance between the print head and the media as much as we can. So that will make a constraint, uh, mechanical constraints in the system. And in a particularly, in a big printer, that might be quite challenging to achieve. Okay, um, so that concludes my, my talk. If you have any questions, it's quite late now, so you can come to our booth and talk to us. All right, thank you so much. Okay. Um,